Peter, these are the years when a man changes into the man he's going to become the rest of his life. Just be careful who you change into. This guy, Flash Thompson, he probably deserved what happened. But just because you can beat him up doesn't give you the right to. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. Welcome back to another episode of Front Row Cinema, a movie podcast for movie lovers by movie lovers. I am your host, TJ Tromboli, and with me, as always, my co-host, the radioactive spider that bit Peter Parker, uh, Mr. James O'Reilly in the house. Hey, somebody had to do it. (laughs) It is true. Listen, I think you, more than anybody, had the greatest power and the greatest responsibility there, more so than uh, Spider-Man ever did. So kudos to you, radioactive spider. Well, thank you. So at least somebody appreciates me. I appreciate you, Spider. And each week we take a look at my 1,000 movies I've seen in theaters and we see how well it's aged along with the hype surrounding the film, its box office analysis, and legacy in the film industry. So if you enjoy this kind of content, hit that sub button on YouTube, leave that five-star review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. It's how you help the channel grow. Jim, what are we watching tonight? We're watching, finally, after what feels like a long wait spider-man like the original 2002 sam raimi spider-man sure we've been hyping this one up for a long time since the very first episode we knew this one was waiting in the wings and it's finally here the 2002 superhero classic spider-man directed by sam raimi written by david coep and starring toby mcguire willem dafoe and kirsten dunce uh now jim i was looking forward to busting out i have the vhs copy here of spider-man really bringing it back far here and i was excited to bust it out to see what kind of gems they put on the back cover there but then i realized if you look to the back there's no plot description on the movie wow (laughs) they didn't put anything that is a bold move. They I just mean, put this yeah. sultry kiss between Kirsten Dunst and Tobey Maguire in the rain on the back, and they figured that that was going to get the job done. What else did they need, though, really? That, <laughs> that is true. You didn't really need much. But so we turned to IMDb, our favorite spot for some glorious log lines, uh, to to go for the plot synopsis for Spider-Man. Wait, and they, so you, they... Don't, you don't have a DVD of this at all? You just so, have a VHS copy. No, I have. I imagine of all the things, I only have the VHS copy of Spider-Man. You've been holding on to a VCR for the last 25 <laughs> years just so you can play this movie. Just so that I could keep on my spot. Spider-Man really looks good picture quality in VHS, so nothing else really, uh, yeah. really uh, it sticks up to the vhs copy no i do have uh a 4k but it is a steelbook so we still don't have a plot synopsis Ah. so we had to turn to imdb and it reads after being bitten by a genetically altered spider teenage peter parker develops spider-like superhuman abilities and adopts a masked superhero identity to fight crime in new york city facing the sinister green goblin in the process yeah, I think that about nails it. They played yeah. it pretty straight. Pretty straight there. Good, good work. That's like IMDb. a common, like when we need to go to IMDb thing that happens though. They're like less loosey goosey on IMDb. Yeah, they, they, but no decidedly odd people uh, for this one. I mean, I, we can go down this road again if we really want to. <laughs> but <laughs> I would say that Willem Dafoe is odd as shit in this movie. <laughs> That is true. Yeah, he is uh, decidedly odd in this movie, that for sure. Uh, and I mean, I guess you could say Peter Parker is also decidedly odd at uh, key moments in this movie. So there's always yeah, there's yeah. always somebody you can uh, you can equate it to uh, for this I one. We'll... The point is, you could right, you could always find somebody in every movie to say that about. Yeah, to find someone that is decidedly odd. <laughs> But um, did you, I'm assuming uh, everyone and their mothers did, did you saw this movie in theaters? Yeah, I did. I did. This was like a huge deal when it came out. Like everybody I knew saw and loved this movie. There was very few people who didn't. So yes, I saw this in theaters and I was a huge fan at the time and I am still a huge fan today. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Getting way ahead of yourself. Did you read any comics? Are you a big comic reader? Uh, no, I mean, like, 
one of my two older brothers was pretty into comic books so like i had some like tangential like knowledge like like knowledge by association with him i guess of some comic book stuff but i was never really big into comic books when i was a kid but like i knew who spider-man was and i knew his girlfriend was mary jane and i knew some of his villains like some of the, mo- the basics spider-man cartoons before this movie came out that was going to be my next question was were were your older brothers into this because we've we've learned that they were did not like lord of the rings did not like jurassic park like there has to be something that gets them and it one sounds like one was, of them comic books was was the was the goat yeah. yeah he was a big fan of comic books yes right. so, so spider-man was the is the only comic that i've really dived into deep um he was my favorite superhero so that the, he was, was the only comics that i've ever actually read and could give you anything that actually happened to be like like seeing a movie i could see the spider-man movie and be like that was from right from the comics but i couldn't do that with any other superhero yeah just by so spider-man was always the was the, was the guy for me um i did also see this one in theaters obviously um big rob big rob took me and zach um, and of course, if Spider-Man is the only comic book I'm reading, clearly I'm dragging Big Rob to take me to go see Spider-Man back in the day. Um, and I actually, they just re-released a few weeks ago, all of, they're doing like a run now where every week they're putting a different Spider-Man movie in theaters. So I got to see the first Spider-Man again in theaters. Um, so now that's, that's, that's twice I've been able to see this absolute classic up on the big screen. When is Spider-Man 2 going to be released based on what you just said? Already happened, my friend. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I saw that one. Saw that one, too. I saw all the Toby ones in theaters, and then I bowed out. I had I have no interest in watching the Andrew Garfield ones Andrew again. Andrew Garfield disasters. Yeah, I think that's what they're up to now is the Andrew Garfield ones, and then, and then they're doing the Tom Holland ones also. Yeah, I don't really care for either of those, Spider-Man. I'm a, I'm a Toby purist. Uh, yeah, I am also a Toby purist, um, and we'll we'll dive into Toby's absolute peak performance as we uh, as we get further on here in this one. Now, Spider Man, this is this is the first movie I feel like we've come to in a long time um, where there truly was this larger than life hype surrounding this movie before it even came out. Like it's like probably not since the Lord of the Rings episode that we've done did have we seen a movie that really captured the zeitgeist before it came out like i remember you know you got your spider-man video games were like huge even before this movie came out oh Uh, yeah dude do you remember that n64 spider-man game yeah dude that game that game was sick (laughs) there was one on on the playstation too also not playstation 2 but playstation PlayStation as well yeah 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 yeah. you got yeah you got there you got (laughs) that was that game was really good too um, I think there so, probably was a PlayStation 2 game also, by the way. Probably. I'm, that up. I'm just guessing. But I no, well, I think, I think the movie tie-in video game came out on PlayStation 2. Like uh, the, the movie, the, the video game movie for Spider-Man was on PlayStation 2. Yeah, yeah and that game. Had, I'm pretty sure the N64 one was before this movie, and that game was yeah. sick. It had yeah, so many came... cool levels. You could unlock so many cool Spider-Man outfits. <laughs> like... Yeah, that game was dirty. That was, that was a fun one right there. That was that's a blast from the past, man. I forgot about the N64 one. Yeah, there was that one level where you were like chasing after somebody and like the cops were chasing you and it was like, "Oh man, such a good game." Yeah, that game was wild. Yeah, so there was just an absolute absurd amount of hype leveling this movie before even a frame of it came out um the tra- the trailers were huge. I think the first trailer also this is a situation same as um Jurassic Park, where they uh, put like a really big trailer out during the Super Bowl. So you're really starting to see that era of, of the Super Bowl trailers really start yeah. to become a thing now. I, I'm pretty sure, too, this movie had to edit it like they released the trailer way back and then they had to edit it because it showed the World Trade Center in it because they filmed it before oh, 9-11. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure this was one where they had like a whole sequence that took place um, at the World <laughs> Trade Center and they the were like... Biggest, uh... No, sorry. That's, no, that's no, yeah. Going. That is pretty wild. Like, because it's in that like kind of time frame where that happens. Yeah. Um. I just you're talking about the hype, and this is coming back to me, where we talked about my older brother who was into comics. I remember he was not interested in seeing this movie at all. 
because he hated the fact that Tobey Maguire was going to be Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, I feel like that's such a time-tested thing these days with fans of anything. Because it happened when, when Michael Keaton was going to be Batman. Everyone was like, fuck that. And then it came out and everyone was like, he is the Batman. And then the same thing happens with Tobey Maguire. The same thing happens with Hugh Jackman. Like, it, name any actor who had to play a superhero that knocked it out of the park and you've got a fanboy around to bitch about it before the fact. Yeah. Well, and I, like I, this is, I was young, so I'm trying to remember exactly what his reasoning was, but like, I think part of it was like Tobey Maguire had always kind of been, he was still like pretty young in all of his roles before this. And he always played like kind of a dweeb, you know what I mean? Like that's why he was like, perfect to play. But, like not Peter even Parker. like a nerd. Like he was just like a total like loser. Like, and then like, like pleasant feels reinforcing good one, the like, point. There's nothing like physically imposing about him or like, he was never really like much of a wise ass in any of his movies, which I think was like a big issue. Even though like now, like in real life, I think he's pretty famous for being like a real like uh, jerk, like behind like, the wise scenes, ass like kind of piece of shit. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Well, he was rolling with the the '90s frat pack boys, which was like Leo, River Phoenix, like those boys. Those yeah. boys went out and hunted. Right. So like for for I think if you were a Hollywood executive, Tobey Maguire was like the perfect pick. But if you were like, if you were just some comic book nerd, you know, you maybe saw Tobey Maguire, like the Cider House Rules or like Pleasantville. And you were like, that guy's <laughs> going to be like a wise cracking like superhero. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I, I could see the hesitance to think he could pull off Spider-Man. But as far as like him pulling off Peter Parker, like I would look at him in Pleasantville and be like, yeah, that's the fucking guy. Like, yeah, yeah right. Absolutely. He does look like a total nerd. Yeah, you're yeah. not wrong. <laughs> yeah. You're like, that's the dude. Let's go. But no, I that's think they've done that. Back to me. and that yeah. that really sums up my brother like he's just looking for reasons to not like things to not like something he yeah like Jurassic park or lord of the rings or any of these like great classic movies yeah but i mean he's not the only one who's like that you got so many fans these days that want to find their reasons to hate on something years before you even see a frame of footage from the thing these days yeah so that no that's just that's the thing i remember most about the hype was that there was some questions about toby mcguire there was there was some backlash well that backlash did not deter anybody from going to the movies because this did movie it, did it we, <laughs> deter anyone deter all right you want you want <laughs> i can't give up uh, <laughs> deter's the guy from jurassic park lost world dude. that's what i'm saying it didn't stop him from going to the movies god jim <laughs> It did not deter there anyone is. from going to see this film because this movie, we we got some stuff to talk about with this box office. So, Jim, let's dive in to some juicy numbers. Numbers, dates, numbers, numbers, dates, array, dates, numbers. Show me the money. So, Spider-Man opens the weekend of May 3rd through May 5th. So, this is like kickoff of the summer movie season in 2002 uh real quick 139 million dollar budget which seems pretty high for a lot of the movies we've done so far right and yeah, that's um, that's hold hold on hold hold one minuto there let me take a look at something right here yeah so we do have some budgets for a lot of movies that we've kept in line with so still not though the highest budget it's not, it's that's the second highest budget we've seen so far for a movie. It's got to be behind Lord of the Rings, right? That's you Jim, you would think the Fellowship only had a budget of 93 million dollars. So tied they tied the whole thing on location. <laughs> that's yeah. so nuts. Okay, yeah. go ahead. So, Sorry. so tied for first place with a 140 million dollar budget. Armageddon and the perfect storm. Wow. Okay. So the perfect oh, yeah. storm costs more money to, to do than Spider-Man. Yeah. Interesting. Because I would say that, like, the budget shows in this movie a lot better than it does in either of those two movies. And especially the perfect storm. Um, That's for sure. But anyway, so it's a $139 million budget. That's a high number, right? Yeah. Um, but for its opening weekend, it does indeed open number one. 
uh, and it opens, it, it reaches a milestone that I think we've kind of like hinted at a few times. We hadn't lo- looked it up at that point, but my memory well, been waiting for. correctly. Uh, Spider-Man is the first movie ever to break $100 million in its three-day opening weekend. It pulls in a monstrous $114.8 million. So it doesn't just cross, but it like absolutely yeah. demolishes that. It jumps over that line. Because our, our previous number one right now is is Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone with only 90.3. So that's right. a that's a big jump right there to 114.8. Yeah, exactly. That is that is like, absolutely huge. It beats it by more than like 20%. You know what I mean? Like, which is insane. Uh just to like further cement some of the dominance here, right? Uh, in second place that weekend, it's the third weekend of Scorpion King with $9 million. Oh, oh Jesus. So not only does it open over $100 million, it beats the second place movie by over $100 million. Yeah, well, it, it basically takes the box office. Like no one was seeing anything else, really. Yeah, and I mean, you pointed this out. This movie had such big hype leading into it. So... As we go down this list, I think the thing that jumps out to me most is a lot of people seem to have just gotten out of the way. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, so in third place um, is the fourth weekend of Changing Lanes. No idea what that is. Oh, it's uh, Ben Affleck and Samuel L. Jackson thriller. Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Fourth place with 3.6 million is the third week of Murder by Numbers. <laughs> oh, it's a Sandra Bullock vehicle right there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I know what that movie is. Yep, another thriller. Uh, fifth place is the second weekend of Life or Something Like It with 3.2 million. Never even heard uh, of that. And then I'm only going to six just because this is another movie I saw in theaters and I kind of enjoyed at the time. Sixth place with 3.1 million, The Rookie. <laughs> nice. Dennis Quaid that, Rookie, Dennis right? Quaid yeah. Rookie, yeah. Yeah, that's um, a good, that is a good movie. Yeah, and then just to further hammer home the point here, um, it shares an opening weekend with a bunch of movies. Most of them I've never heard of and, like, don't even crack the top 50. Uh, the two most worth mentioning in seventh place, Deuces Wild. I've heard of that. That is. <laughs> um and then in 11th place hollywood ending also don't know what that is Those Never are that, either. Two that are anywhere near the top 10 uh that share an opening weekend with spider-man so like it does really well and i think most people knew it was going to do really well and most studios were kind of like yeah okay just do well we'll we'll skip it <laughs> like yeah. we'll let you have this one everybody there's knew like, there... there's no competition here is the point you know Nobody, nobody knew. Everyone saw the writing on the wall. They were like, we're not touching that because that's going to be a monster hit. And it was a monster hit. It, it, it's the largest May opening beating Lost World. And I think Lost World was uh, the second, the previous second place highest earner with 72.1. So that's a that's a that's another huge jump for the month of May, going from 72.1 kicking off the summer movie season to 114.8 kicking off the summer movie season. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, um, all that's right, big. So week two, with that huge number, only a 37.8% drop down to 71.4 million. And obviously it stays in first place. Um, obviously. That 71, too, is good enough to take the record for the highest grossing second weekend of all time as well. Nice. Yeah, so it's, it's crushing the game. And I yeah. mean, again not really much in the way of competition here yet right so opening this weekend in second is unfaithful that's like a oh. diane lane richard gear movie yep. if i remember correctly yes it is you're obviously like that's some counter programming and you're not yeah. expecting it to do nearly as well as spider-man that's like the previous yeah. week the boyfriend took his girlfriend to see spider-man and then now the next week she's like i'm dragging you to see unfaithful right right exactly <laughs> yeah so that that comes in second with 14 million and then also not necessarily going after the same audience here maybe a little bit third place uh the new guy with nine million the dj qualls uh, led <laughs> yeah oh that's a movie all right <laughs> jesus uh and then yeah so like a bunch of those same movies kind of like stay in in the a bunch of the ones we went over last week kind of stay in the fold too yeah. uh weekend three 
it's gonna get toppled here. Um, I am not going to say the name because just based on the name, I have a feeling it's gonna be our next episode. Ah, I got. Ah, uh, okay. I think I know what it is. Yeah. So it gets toppled. What I'll say for now is it gets toppled by a, a movie institution that it makes sense that it beat the third weekend of Spider Man, no matter how big Spider Man is. Uh, so, but Spider-Man does hold second place. It pulls in 45 million in weekend three, um, still beats out like a lot of those same movies we're talking about. And again, this one only a 36.9% drop. So that's pretty legit, right? You said, you said 45 for its third weekend. Yeah. Dude, that's even, we're just breaking records left and right here. That's, that's good enough to be the biggest third weekend of all time. Also. Jeez. So yeah, and so since we've kind of found the the next movie, I'm pretty sure, I'm not going to keep going week by week here. We'll just ride Spider-Man out of the top 10, right? Do it. So Weekend 4, it holds second with 28.5 million. Uh, another sub 40% drop, 36.7%. Uh, weekend 5, oh, and that's also a holiday weekend. So for the Memorial, well, that's Memorial Day, Day right? right? And the yeah. holiday, it pulls in 35.8, which is really good. Yeah, that's um, choice. For a fourth weekend, yeah. Uh, weekend 5, it stays in third place. This is where we see our first, like, really substantial drop, 49.8%. Um, it's down to 14.3 million. Uh, weekend 5, oh, by the way, the World Cup in Korea is going on right now. I don't know nice. if you remember that we need, one. We need to know. I need to know this about this. Maybe the last World Cup that the U.S. did well in, if I remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, so Weekend 6, uh, it pulls in 10 million. It's in 5th place. Uh, weekend 7, it's in 7th place with 7.5 million. Weekend eight, we're finally getting to the edge here. Oh uh, boy! It's in tenth place with four point five million. Ooh, and, and then finally, eight. all the way in weekend nine, Spider-Man drops to eleventh place with three point one million. By the end of its That's... run in the top ten, it's grossed three hundred and ninety-five point nine million domestic. You are you're jumping all over with numbers. That is that is crazy. So it spent eight weeks, not nine. Uh, no, no, nine, no, no, it's oh, it's wait, ninth. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's ninth right. week. It was out. Okay, so eight weeks. Sorry, wow, right. that's crazy. All right, so it's still so eight weeks is good enough to join the Lost World Jurassic Park and How the Grinch Stole Christmas at eight weeks. Uh, a notable movie that hand that lasted one week longer, Shrek. Oh. Nine weeks. Oh, actually, no. This one's yeah. even crazier. Ten weeks in the box office. Rush Hour Two. Yeah, so but that Rush comes Hour out in like August, so yeah. of course it stays longer. Like it's, it's still September is one of those dead months. It still stayed longer, and then it's two weeks at number one. Uh, ties it with the Lost World again, Gladiator, and the Mummy Returns. Um, okay. Good, good company right there for it. Yeah, yeah, and then I mean, so just closing it up with some totals here, it finishes with four hundred and let's call it four hundred and eight million domestic. Okay. Uh, 418 international, and then for a worldwide total of 826 million. Boy, 826 million. That is fucking good. That is good enough to round out a stellar top five now. So Spider Man's going to slot into that number five spot with that oh, 100. That's and... also, that what? 826 is including some extra stuff too. Oh, like re releases? Like yeah, it, it originally leaves theaters in August of that year, and then it looks like it comes back out September 6th, which is odd. This might be worth looking into. Oh, it came out, there was like some kind of weird like double feature thing with that and Men in Black. Oh, fuck. <laughs> it looks like it was just for one day, maybe. <laughs> like, what but... a double feature. Oh, because they're both Columbia pictures. Okay. I guess, All right. Yeah. That so, makes more sense. I was like, what so the that's fuck? What it's gets weird. It to its its uh eight twenty six number. To eight twenty six. Okay. I mean, even even without it, it's still gonna take five. Uh the no the it beat it's beaten Lost World, which was six eighteen. So no matter what it shakes out to, it was beaten at. Um so yeah, so it settles into number five now with eight twenty six, right behind Lord of the Rings the Fellowship with eight sixty eight. So that's uh, yeah, that's good. Really good. That's good company. And, and uh, just 
while we're yeah, here talking about different releases, it does have the April 15th, 2024 release in here. Oh, Hold yeah. 3.9 more million domestic. That it does. It did some uh, some good stuff when I went and saw it. It did yeah, it did really well, those re-releases. So they were smart to, to do that. Um, I have a few random records here for you, Jim, to just, you okay. know, continue and tally on all these crazy records to really show just how well this hype paid off for this movie. Um, so, you know, we mentioned already it was the largest May opening. It beat X-Men's record, a previous movie that we've done for the highest superhero opening, which obviously it was going to do. And then it dethroned 1989's Batman as the highest grossing superhero movie of all time. Now, this movie was an absolute sprint through the box office. It was the fastest movie to 100 million, three days, like we talked about. Right, it was right. the fastest movie to 200 million with nine days. Fastest movie to 300 million at 22 days. And then it tied Titanic for fastest movie to 400 million at 66 days. So that is yeah. huge company right there. That's yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah, and that it's is also like insane. That's kind of the blueprint for how you see movies get to those big numbers these days. Like very few of them now that end up in like the top tops of all time are like Titanic where they have like a really mid opening weekend and then just like have crazy legs. Now it's like they get to a billion dollars in like eight days and then, and then they, and then they also have crazy legs, but like it's a hundred meter dash these days. Like it, you're right, just off like to this, the races immediately. This is definitely more of like a prototypical, like it's very front loaded. Like everybody's going to see it opening weekend. It's the biggest story in entertainment kind of a thing. That's how you get to those like 1.5, $2 billion numbers these days. So it's interesting because this is probably the first time you see like somebody kind of like really capitalize on that mold, I guess. I think this really set the benchmark for what would define blockbusters going forward in the 2000s. And especially you really see it hit new heights in the 2010s, like just absurd heights at that point. And I, th and I, I agree with you. I feel like this movie is really the one that, that kicks it off. I have one last fun stat here uh as part of these box office totals and i found it interesting because we literally just did this with harry potter so we had uh when we were talking about the harry potter box office where their friday total the single day friday total was the highest grossing of all time and then they yeah. broke their own record the next day for saturday oh, yeah, yeah. so spider-man is going to do the exact same thing so it's friday single day total 39 million Highest of all time, beating Harry Potter's Saturday of 33.5. Spider-Man on Saturday, going to break its own record, does 43.6. Wow, that's interesting that it beat Harry Potter's Saturday, too. Because, like, the Friday feels like the harder day to do that with. Yeah, that it's Friday broke that record is, is crazy. And I think that's a thing that, at least for the 2000s, we're going to see that happen fairly consistently when, when we come yeah. to these big event movies. Well, yeah, because I mean, this is also like the last kind of note I have on this. This is like now that somebody's broken 100 million, it kind of becomes the benchmark going forward for like, is this really a blockbuster movie or not? Like, was this blockbuster movie a success or not? Like, you have to break 100 million for your movie to be like once, like a, once, a huge success. Yeah, once Spider-Man did it, like there's no going back. It's like now everybody's got to do it or we're, or we're fucked here. Yeah, and like most for a while here, it becomes pretty commonplace that people do break it. <laughs> like that yeah, it do break it. Like it pretty much becomes the norm. We're gonna see it a few more times in in this year calendar year of two thousand and two that we're doing because, crazily enough, after all of these numbers that we've talked about and everything, Spider Man was only the third highest grossing movie of of two thousand and two. So there's wow, two, after that yeah. hot of a start. Wow, this yeah. summer must be nuts. Yeah. So there's there's two other movies in the wings that are going to at least on paper for worldwide do better than this and i i think i know one of them at least uh um, i don't want to keep teasing it because i'm pretty sure it's the movie i stopped on on the box office i would imagine <laughs> no actually i was thinking of the other of a different one but yeah that one probably did it too if i had to take a guess oh interesting okay yeah so but yeah but the two other movies out there for 2002 that we still have to get to that are did better than this opening so it's that's an app it, it goes to show that spider-man was not a once lightning in a bottle thing that it was absolutely going to be the norm going forward yeah yeah 
and it's also like it wasn't like totally out of nowhere that it broke 100 million like we kind of saw that in our big movies as we've gone through this like it ramping up and getting closer yeah. and closer so it makes sense that there's like it wasn't like a total outlier like there's like other people coming that'll that'll do the same thing that makes yeah, sense. you saw like the writing was on the wall that that was quickly where we were heading to and spider-man just happened to be the first one to come along to really kickstart it and break the mold yeah although i do remember it being huge news like I still have, like, the image of watching, like, my mom loves Good Morning America. And when I was a kid, like, it was, like, they were yeah. all they were talking about on Good Morning America. It was like, oh, my God, Spider-Man. <laughs> like... Yeah, well, especially back then, like, that's just insane to, to like, contextualize. Like, they did, like, a movie did 100 million in three days. Like, especially because, like, you see throughout the 90s and everything that, like, movies even when they do really well are still not like crazy huge earners you were seeing things like level out at around 500 million and then oh, so yeah as we're getting into this new millennium it just takes on this whole new form so that uh, the 2000s were a much more wilder time when it came to movies in the box office and i think i understood when we were kids so this is absolutely huge to see yeah well it's almost like we were spoiled like we were just saying like it becomes like more commonplace for people to break it and it's like almost like a benchmark for you to say your movie was a success at all if it's got a big budget so like I think it's like now that some time has passed and like not a lot of movies break a hundred million dollars at the box office at all, no matter how big their budget was, it's kind of yeah. like, oh, wow. Yeah, really? Like they were striking gold back then, like way more often than I gave them credit for. Yeah, especially seeing like post COVID now where the bubble is burst and you've got these movies with these insane budgets of 200 to 300 million. And then you've got openings in like the 50 to 60 million range. And you're just like, yeah, what the like fuck? Like, where they open to 50 or 60 million and people are kind of like, oh, that's not so bad. Like, yeah. <laughs> they did pretty well. Like, <laughs> Whereas every movie from before COVID is just, like, pathetic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, anyway, I feel like we've talked enough about the box office. What do you, like, do you want to get into the actual, like, movie part of this? Yeah, let's dive in. Let's dive into the thick of this bad boy, Jim. Because obviously I'm sure both of us have a lot of glorious memories and thoughts on this movie we've had 20 something years to percolate on this bad boy yeah yeah and i mean who knows how many times i've seen it in those 20 years i know it's a lot like it's north of 10 so yeah definitely especially this 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 trilogy especially coming out like when, when you get these movies that came out in the 2000s where it was like prime real estate for our like teenage years these these movies definitely tend to be in the rotation a lot more than any other movies. All right. So do you want to, what do you like about it? What do you like? What, what's your, what's, kick it off here. All right. So I love, I love a lot about this movie, but I think the thing that stands out the most to me that really cements why I love this movie so much is just Sam Raimi's total understanding of how to effectively write Peter Parker and Spider-Man's dichotomy in yeah, this movie. He's, he's the perfect guy, yeah. Yeah, and also, like, credit also goes to Tobey Maguire because he also, like, it's one thing to write it well, but then you also have to get the actor to also nail what you've done. Yep. And I think I just think the relationship between the two of them, no one has captured um, the dichotomy of Peter Parker and Spider-Man, as well as the combo of Tobey Maguire and Sam Raimi. Um, yeah. I think I, Tom Holland's is is not bad. Like, I, I enjoy his Spider-Man, but I think it only works in the context of the MCU. Like, if it was just him on his own outside of this whole entire world, like, it falls apart for me. Kind of like how Andrew Garfield's one falls apart, because, like, you see Andrew Garfield's one, and he's riding a skateboard to school. And it's like, bro, like, no, he doesn't. Like, Peter Parker doesn't ride a skateboard. Like, get the fuck out of here. Like, that guy's cool. Like, Andrew Garfield's, like, one of the most handsome men on the planet. Like, fuck off. I, like, I'm with you. I think Tobey Maguire and Sam Raimi are the best combo to ever do this. And I think Sam Raimi is the perfect guy. Because if you look at, like, his Evil Dead movies, like, you know, like, it's the same yeah. tone, right? Like, the, yeah. the kind of, like, goofy, like, one-liners while you're fighting people, that kind of stuff. Very b um, movie. The only thing I'll disagree with, I like, I think the Tom Holland Spider-Man, like, I get what you're saying, like, it works in the MCU, as in, like, when he's in a Captain America movie, like, he plays better, because the movie's not about him, 
but I think also the MCU kind of like drags down those three movies for me in a way that like like in in Homecoming it bugs me that he's trying to protect the Avengers plane at the end rather than like Queens New York you know what I mean like, no no that I bugs me. <laughs> I totally agree with you that's why like I mean like him like you take him out and he, he falls apart like his own movies fall apart because yeah I don't want to see all that shit even and even like the way they write him too like. I don't want you to bring like real life aspects of teenagers into him in a sense, because when you see Tom Holland's Peter Parker, like you have the one thing where they're trying to like fight the alien in Endgame or Infinity War and uh, and and Tony Stark's like, yeah, but the kids seen more movies and the kid just like references Star Wars and Indiana Jones and shit. And it's like, I don't want my Spider-Man Peter Parker to do that. Like, I want him to exist in his own like comic book world i don't want him exactly. to exist in my world exactly yeah that i all agree with for sure and like yeah we're saying the same thing i think we're just saying it different ways yeah, like exactly. i would prefer it if his movies were just in a spider-man world exactly yeah no them. i'm i'm the exact um, i'm the exact same way and i think that's why this one works so well and is still the standard bearer because even just the way this movie kicks off like they they understand peter parker so well like it kicks yeah. off and you get the little voiceover from him and he's such a loser that he yeah. even wishes that he was the fat kid on the bus who's spilling a jelly donut all over his shirt like that's how much of a loser peter parker is right that the he would be the dude minutes. yeah like he would be the dude spilling jelly donut on himself more than him and the bus yeah. driver's even laughing at him as he's watching him yeah. like run across like he's the biggest loser on the planet and it's, it's so good it, yeah that first 10 or 15 minutes because i think it's about 15 minutes when he gets bitten uh, they get to it like pretty quick honestly um but that first like 10 or 15 minutes there's that one thing i will remember forever it's like burned into my brain when uh mary jane i think it's mary jane is like waving at him and he's like oh hey and then like she's actually looking at the people behind him and it's like oh no and, like the secondhand like, embarrassment you feel in that moment is is just yeah. unbridled it's it's awful yeah you just like you totally like get the picture of this guy's like it's not even that he's like a loser or a nerd it's that he's nobody you know what i mean like he's, he's invisible, almost just invisible basically. yeah he's invisible and that's that one too to do that with mary jane is a good way to empathize us to him as well because like everyone knows that kind of embarrassment where you just like you feel like such a loser because you did yeah, something where you stupid thought, like that you thought something was one way and you totally misread the situation and now everybody's looking at you like what the fuck are you doing man <laughs> like yeah the poor poor guy yeah, so they, they do bad. they do such a good job of painting him as this loser right off the bat and then also empathizing you to him because he's just like he's he is this loser. But at the same time, you're like, he's so lovable, like this poor kid, man, like just give him a friend like God, throw him a bone, Mary Jane. Yeah. And also in that first 10 or 15 minutes, which is, again, like necessary for a superhero movie like this. And like in a lot of ways, this becomes the blueprint for like all of these superhero movies that we see going forward, like. I feel like you could say that like and this is probably pretty similar to like ones that came before it as well but like in terms of like a modern like superhero blockbuster i feel like every movie after this copies a lot of these beats um you meet the villain in the first 10 or 15 minutes like you set up the connection to willem dafoe you introduce who who uh norman osborne is and like you kind of like see that him and peter have something in common right because that's like that's what is a core to like all of these especially marvel movies is that the villain and the superhero are like two sides of the same coin kind of you know what i mean like they're like, like the inverse of each other yeah and what i like about it in this movie as opposed to marvel movies is that like their powers aren't the same like because that's a thing in marvel movies like where oh, yeah, like every that. every villain like yeah. has like oh you have an ant-man suit i have a bumblebee suit and it makes me small what are the odds you know like but you're good and i'm evil like that's how like all those movies are uh, so, like, you got wakandan technology i've got wakandan technology yeah, yeah exactly right so like i like that this one sticks to you know i'm something of a scientist myself <laughs>
I like that, that it sticks to just that they're both scientists, right? Like they're both like hyper intelligent and they're both kind of like driven in that world. Um, and like, it's a thing that stays true through all of these Spider-Man movies for sure. But like definitely through the Sam Raimi ones. Uh, well, I maybe not so much in the third one, but in the second one, it's the same idea. Like where he's like fighting like Doc Ock is like also a big scientist but like their powers aren't identical you know what i mean like like D green goblin is bringing something different to the table than spider-man like which i enjoy well that i love too that that whole first you know like segment you're talking about there does so much heavy lifting without you even realizing and, and i think that's why so many people have taken to copying it and using it because it's an absolute blueprint because you know like we talked about not only are we getting we're learning quickly that peter parker is a loser Mary Jane is a popular girl. He's in love with her. He's invisible to her. Then we see, you know, Harry pull up with Norman Osborn. You see right off the bat that, you know, Harry lives in the shadow of his father's excellence and feels, you know, neglected by him and just wants to find a way to get his father to really see him and love him. And right, right off the bat, you see that, that Norman... Yeah, they have money. Yeah, you see that they have money. But then right after that, when Norman comes out and meets Peter, you can Harry can see it in his father's eyes, the absolute respect that Norman has yep. for Peter right off the bat, just from learning about like what the kid is into, uh, like giving I'm something of a scientist myself, like right off the bat. Harry sees that Norman is giving Peter immediately what he's been chasing his whole life. So you're getting you're getting every bit of like juice that we need out of all of these characters within like a three to four minute scene. It's it's yeah. so, it's yeah. picture perfect screenwriting right there. Yeah. And then, I mean, not too long after that, he's getting bitten by a spider and we're like jumped. We're off to the yeah. second and we're off to the race. One really. Yeah, Would you need to you need to be like that? Because even with you know, going right in within like 10, 15 minutes, he's getting bitter ready. There is a lot of setup in this movie. It, it, there yeah. is such a juggling act of setting shit up to go with this movie. Well, yeah, it's, it's crazy that this movie still only clocks in at, at two hours. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I mean, it's because they're really efficient in this early, these early parts. Like you're saying, there's a lot of heavy lifting, but they're just kind of getting to the point and they're keeping me interested the whole time. And it moves like it, the whole sequence where he's, um kind of starting to figure out his powers um like he gets bitten by the spider and immediately you see the distance it causes between him and uh uncle ben and aunt may because well, he comes he didn't, home he didn't he's come like, home oh, i'm not gonna eat dinner i'm just going up to sleep yeah like, had a bite go like, to sleep yeah he's like not feeling well he's like he's already causing strife there and then like as he's finding out about his powers like you see that wedge start to get bigger and bigger where like they can't understand what he's going through or at least that's how he feels like he can't talk to them about the thing that's changing which is like a huge deal and i mean like you know there's there's like the obvious like coming of age like comparison like where kids are like becoming teenagers and like getting out of high school and like they feel like nobody understands me you know so like that's really like that's a big draw for like somebody our age seeing this movie right like that like you like totally relate to um and i love about that part that by the end of it uncle ben has swung it back around to like that clip we played in the intro which is like look it doesn't really matter the specifics of what you're going through i get what you're going through and like whatever you got going on like you need to take you need to treat it with responsibility you know what i mean like you need to like stay true to who you are and do the right shit because otherwise like it, whatever it is it's going to hurt you in the end you know what i mean if you don't it's, it is funny that he frames it, though, in the scenario of Fla like fighting Flash, because like it, you see the scene and like with the way Flash like throws that punch at him and hits that locker. Like, I'm like, I feel like it was OK for Peter to defend himself right there. Like... Well, but so, yeah, I mean, yes, he's allowed to defend himself. But Uncle Ben's point is you are too strong to be doing that shit to the flashes of the world. You're bigger than those people now. You can't do it because one, they don't know what the fuck they're getting into. You know what I mean? Like, like, and like, it's interesting because he doesn't really understand any of this stuff, but that's what Peter ought to be hearing in the scene. You know what I mean? Oh no, like, Yeah, absolutely. Like, it doesn't matter if a guy's an asshole, you could crush his skull on a whim at this point <laughs> with, the, with the amount of, with the abilities you have. And you can't do that. Like, that's not okay. <laughs> like, 
Well, he he even like learns the lesson right in the moment without even like it being heard because even after he's done what he's always dreamed of doing in his head, which is you know defending himself against Flash and and hitting him back and and winning, you still yeah. get Flash's friend who looks at me. He's like, Jesus, Parker, you are a freak. Like he's, he's a bigger <laughs> loser after that. Although it seemed to go over well with the rest of the school, honestly. <laughs> like. Yeah, all Which the background, also... all the background actors are so good in that scene. If you watch yeah. any of them, they're so yeah. fucking hilarious. Yeah. Which, by the way, you brought up how Tom Holland, you don't like the high school side of it. It's another reason why you might like this movie better, because everybody in high school is obviously like 27 years old. Yeah, like... It is. Dude, fucking Flash Thompson is Joe Mangianello. Like that guy looked like yeah. when you see him, they're like, how old are you? He's like 17. Like, motherfucker, you look 30. <laughs> yeah. That's this might be the worst offender of a movie where everybody who's in high school is like very clearly a grown adult. <laughs> like, it's so funny though that like when you're when you are a kid and a teenager though and you're watching it, you don't even think about that. Like I watched it as a teenager and never once thought for a second, like, oh no, those are like grown 30 year olds. Like I was just like, Oh yeah, cool, like all right, awesome. Like high schoolers, let's go. Yeah, I but then you look back on it now that... and you're like, dude, those motherfuckers are old. Yeah, I think it's something that you notice more now because, like, as time has gone on, I think they've kind of, like, tried to not make it as obvious. So, whereas, like, back then when you saw a movie, that's how all teenagers looked in movies. Like, now, like, teenagers actually look like teenagers in a lot of these. Like, Tom Holland looks like a high school kid in the first Spider-Man movie. You know what I mean? I, so, I mean, like, even look now back, he still like, looks young. Yeah, right. So, like, I think they make more of an effort now to have people who are younger look younger, whereas back then it was just like, ah, nobody, nobody cares. <laughs> like, bring so us back like to that. More that's, pronounced. That was gold. Bring us back to that. I want Joe Manganiello in high school again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, but yeah. So, like, I don't know. So, like, it gets through that whole like getting your powers scene, and also the scene where William De Willem Dafoe gets his powers is amazing too. Yeah, <laughs> like, so unhinged. Whole... The way in which, like, he's losing his grasp on his ability to control science is is so unhinged. And it's a testament to how good of an actor Willem Dafoe is. Like, they, they knew exactly what they were doing, getting him for this role. Because he goes so big in so many scenes, and it's exactly what the movie needs for something as iconic and larger than life as the Green Goblin. Yeah, it's it's part of that tone you were talking about. Like, if your superhero is going to be this, like, wisecracking, like, dude, and this kind of feels a lot like the Evil Dead movies, too. Like, your villain needs to be goofy in a way. Like, he's still, like, imposing and, and scary, but at the same time, he's, like, so over the top about how villain how much of a villain he is you know? Yeah. Like, like, he's so, like, Shakespearean um, about it, like, when he's behind the mask. It's it's so funny. Like you get that scene after he like sleep paralysis Spider Man and like gives him the pitch to like join forces and he's like waxing poetically like on the rooftops. Like it's like, dude, yeah. like what is he doing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, it just goes. This is probably my favorite part of this movie. Is I think the casting, like looking back on it, is just perfect in so many places. Like. I can't imagine anybody playing the Green Goblin besides Willem Dafoe. You know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. it's just like for the tone they're going for and the way he plays it, it's exactly what the movie needs, you know? Um, Even like his... He talks his... about Tobey Maguire's casting. He's perfect as Spider-Man yep. in this, I think. Uh, Kirsten Dunst is great as Mary Jane. Like, she's she's looking great in the upside down kiss which is like yeah. the most iconic movie scene maybe ever <laughs> yeah and you also got to give this movie all the credit in the world for actually casting an age-appropriate aunt may oh yeah right because they really because then really after that yeah because they just she just progressively gets younger and younger with every iteration like what andrew garfield's i think was sally field and then for Tom Holland, it yeah. was hot Marissa Tomei. It was like, like yep, Marissa Tomei. Yeah. They were like, yep, Marissa Tomei, because you know what? We need Tony Stark to want to fuck her. It's like, all right. Yeah. And again, though, it's yeah. just like, it's exactly what the movie needs. Like, um, having like a kind of like kindly old Aunt May and this like, you know, this like solid Uncle Ben who's like kind of past his prime and he's still trying to hold on in Queens. You know what I mean? Like, like it's the perfect like 
like authority figures for him it's the perfect parental figures for him for like what he is in the movie um and it's like it's really his drive right to be like the hero that he becomes is like because he comes from those solid strong people you know it's got um, those good roots it's like they're perfect and then we haven't even talked about maybe the greatest casting in the history of movies with uh with jk simmons as as uh j jonah, jonah jameson, jameson. Like, there's never been a more perfect depiction thought, in a movie as far as i thought movies. you were gonna say macho man randy savage as bone saw i mean he's good too <laughs> <laughs> he's good bone too. saw is ready <laughs> yeah. which but, yeah i mean jk simmons though as j jonah jameson it's like it's it's I, like, ripped right from just, the pages right it's just who j jonah jameson is in my head for all time at this point you know what i mean like he's he plays it so incredibly well so no freelance perfect for a kid like you <laughs> yeah <laughs> and he like and he's just such a worm like he's like you can tell he's bilking uh toby mcguire out of money as soon as he's trying to sell the picture yeah, like, let me see these pictures like, <laughs> terrible awful run it on page one yeah, yeah. Right, put it on page one. Yeah. I give it two hundred dollars for the lot. Like yeah. not even for one. Like one of those pictures is good enough for like two hundred bucks. He's like, I'll take it for the lot. But also like, and this is one of the things that works in its favor because I love like movies that don't take themselves seriously and like they just like don't think about it. But I love every time he brings a picture to J. Joe to Jameson, and it's the most absurd. Like the only way Peter could have ever gotten that picture is if he was Spider Man. Right, right. If you look it's at like those pictures and you're like, wacky's going on. Yeah. You're like, he's like 60, he's like 100 feet up off the side of a building, like taking a picture of Spider Man, just like chilling. And it's like, dude, like, you're Spider Man, right? Like, come on. Yeah. And he gets like so many good close ups of him, like in full web swing. Where it's yeah, like, like dude, I love how are, how are you yeah. holding that camera? camera? Where are you standing? <laughs> and like, I also love too, like, if you take it at face value and believe what he's saying, where he's just like, I'm Spider Man's official photographer, it's just like, wh how did you get that job? Like, you yeah, just right. went up to like, Spider Man and was like, Sir, I, each other yeah, <laughs> I would really like if I could take your picture for you, sir. Yeah. It's and so, no, so, like, so, like, so casting's sorry. great. Um, and then I, just like the story of him and and green goblin kind of like cat and mousing throughout the whole movie like, like is so good and just how like green goblin becomes that force right like this this thing of evil it's the first time that he's really had to step up to something insane like to fight as spider-man and how he has to do it and like how he learns that he has to do it because he lets the guy who robbed the wrestling thing go like and that guy ends up shooting uncle ben it's just like oh man such a perfect movie man and all i also love too is you know you you don't see it a lot with older with newer um superhero movies because you have to go so big and so insane but what i love so much about this movie is that the final battle isn't really so much this big huge fight like there is like the, a, a good fight scene between them, but it's not, it's it's very like close quarters and tight. But I love that the big final battle for this movie is is Spider-Man having to make a choice between right. saving people that die, that Green Goblin brings him to about him personally and not just like, hey, you're the bad guy, I'm the good guy, like we have to fight now. Like it's, it's framed in a way that makes Spider-Man have to not only make a choice to, you know, bear that responsibility but then also the fight between them is just this close quarter combat between them just jockeying for position it's not this huge you know webbing around and doing these crazy acrobatics it's just yeah, a yeah. down and dirty in the mud fight yep and what i what i love about it is the stakes honestly like we've talked about like kind of how superhero movies have developed out of this movie a few times in this episode and it's like nowadays the stakes in your superhero movie are always so ridiculous <laughs> they're always like like yeah, the whole the world universe, the world yeah the world right, has got to like, be at stake or the universe now has to be half at stake. of all life is going to get destroyed you know yeah. what i mean like like that's like trillions upon trillions of living things are going to die and like really like this movie when it comes down to it is just like is are the people of new york city gonna be subject to the whims of a bully <laughs> that's literally what it comes down to yeah. like it's like not even like all of them are gonna die like is the green goblin gonna be allowed to do what he wants just because he's crazy and has a glider and super strength you know what i mean like well i also love that that the, 
the Green Goblin's like whole plan was just for like him and Spider Man to team up and then I guess like kill the mayor and just take over New York City and like just oh, run it. That's the idea. He doesn't yeah. have like some like grandiose Grand like, plan, yeah. blow up the building plan. Yeah. He's just like, dude, can you believe we have these powers? We can do whatever the fuck we want. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, this he's is like, we can, yeah. he's like, like, we can just run New York, dude. Like you and yeah. me, like you're rolling, like it's going to be great. And part of what makes that choice so great and like the reason Green Goblin asks spider-man to join him is because you're the only guy who can stop me <laughs> like if we team up we can literally do anything we want so it's like yeah like i'm the only guy who can stop you and with great power comes great responsibility that means i have to stop you because you're a fucking lunatic you know what i mean like that's it those are the stakes <laughs> like he absolutely is a lunatic i love the way that they you know illustrate that fact like my favorite scene in this movie is when Aunt May is just going to bed at night and she's saying her prayers and he explodes the side of her building and yeah. comes in at the end of the prayer just so that he can go, fetch it! And she's like, oh, me. Yeah. <laughs> One of the more unhinged movie scenes like of all time, yeah. <laughs> it's so insane. And the I'm glider so is like, inside her like band box in the queen's house so like the whole room is getting like blown around by the engine <laughs> like yeah, just... dude he's he's unhinged even the way he kills the rest of the board members like he just creates a bomb that turns them into skeletons that just like rips away their entire flesh and organs yep yeah like it's like dude this guy is fucking crazy i also dude, love, I love that, that they too, never when he attacks the guy in the exo suit <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what i was literally just about that to say like I, but not only that like i love that we never get fuller context into like the world or after that scene because he basically showed up and murdered like three high-ranking government right. officials at like a secret guy, military base and then it's never gets... on the joint chiefs of staff yeah <laughs> and you never see like the country like after that it just cuts to graduation and everyone's like yeah how good is this place they're like oh well we got apartments now high school's over <laughs> like, <laughs> like the world just go because it's like two scenes later it's like the thanksgiving day parade and everyone's having a great time and it's like yeah nothing bad ever happens to this place yeah. you know how the joint oh, which... staff got murdered like three days ago yeah by the way that's a that's an interesting bit of trivia do you know where they filmed that that thanksgiving's day parade scene Oh, but I'm assuming it's not New York since uh, you're giving it not to Not in New York City. They filmed that in, uh, in like, on Long Island, dude, in, like, Bethpage. Really? Yeah, I used to work in, like, a industrial, like, complex over there. And they have, st at least the last time I was there, this is, like, years ago now, they still had the bleachers with, like, the tickets thing on the side of them. Like, because, like, they obviously didn't, like, all the buildings and stuff are, like, CGI, but, like, a lot yeah. of the, like, like the bleachers that people are sitting in and like they tried to like set up like kind of like a, a faux like Times Square thing. Wow. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like right in, it's right on Long Island that they filmed that. Look at that. Right up the road from us. Good on you, Long Island. <laughs> this movie is just it, we, you know, we talk a lot about it in a lot of these, you know, bigger event movies that we do. And it's great when you can get the big blockbuster status but that's but uh, the movie still knows how to just utilize and execute picture perfect filmmaking and screenwriting yeah. to give you that big blockbuster because so many blockbusters that you see today care about the spectacle and not so much the substance and it's yeah. always great when you can get those two to meld really well together and it's not even like the substance needs to be like like you don't need academy award winning substance you just need something to anchor your blockbuster spectacle together. And right. this movie uses Peter Parker's uh, learning and understanding of responsibility just perfectly to illustrate that movie. You know, we, right. we, it's it's kind of like in the same sense as like Frodo learning responsibility. And it's it's just a coming of age story. Like it's, it, right. and it's just done very well. It just happens mm -hmm. to be his coming of age story is him learning how to be a superhero spider. Right. You need like, you need human um, emotions and human relationships for me to really care about your blockbuster spectacle. And like, like you just said, it's the perfect, like, 
he's growing up and like part of growing up is like learning that like maybe the people you were friends with in high school aren't the people you need to be spending your time with now like their dads being like an evil super villain is a pretty extreme right. way to show that off but it's to your point though it's still a coming of age thing where you have to be like well i don't really what do i actually know about this guy <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah. um and yeah, like it's 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 just it's interesting, and this is kind of a thing that makes Spider-Man work for me as a character. It's like him kind of like making his way in his early twenties, like through New York City, and like how hard that is, even if you are the the town's favorite superhero, <laughs> yeah, the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Yeah, and and even though you're watching all the stuff of him being the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, the stuff that anchors you to him is is all of the coming of age stuff that every single one of us goes through. You know, Peter Parker's still pining after a girl that he thinks doesn't think he exists in the way that he wants her to look at him. He's right. struggling how- to find a job in the city. He's trying to balance school with a job and a social life. So right. he's he's and going through the, all of these things. Passion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. which is sliding, fighting crime <laughs> fighting crime as the spider-man speaking of pining after the girl by the way how great is the ending of this movie <laughs> like yeah where when, he just has to step up and like shut her down he has to like he can't and that's he the can't perfect again. yeah and that's the perfect acceptance of him fully accepting yeah, what Uncle Ben has told him: with great right. power comes great responsibility, and he knows that not, even though he wants be to be have with him, all the things you want, yeah, that you might like not get of what you need to do. Exactly, every relationship is not going to be one that you're going to be able to get everything out of that you want because you have this huge responsibility. So he has to be the man. It's it's him shedding the boy and becoming the man that he needs right. to be. Right, because yeah. everywhere else in that movie. If she tried to have that conversation with him, like at any other frame, he probably would have caved and been like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. I'm so happy. Yeah, and, right. But when, when she has it at the perfect time, because he's learned that he can't, you know? Um, yeah, especially just, like once he sees, like after like Norman dies, you know, and he sees what it does to Harry and then not only sees how it, you know, affected Aunt May and everybody by, you know, Norman, like hunting him down. It's that perfect thing where he knows, like, I have to keep like my identity is the most important thing. Like, that is what I have to focus on more than anything else is making sure that no one can harm the people that I love again. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, so like it's it's just really great. And then like last last thing for me, I think it, like we've talked a bunch about like trilogies and um, how a lot of times the first movie suffers because they are trying to like set things up, right? Um, and I think that this is actually a pretty interesting one because they do set up a lot that some of it doesn't pay off to like the third movie. A lot of the stuff Peter's going through pays off again in the second movie. Um, You know, the second movie, I don't want to get too much into it now, but it has that pretty classic superhero sequel where he, like, loses his powers for a little bit, like, which happens in, like, every sequel movie. Um, So, like, it does set up all of that stuff, but it doesn't set it up. It sets it up in a way that still jives with the movie the first one's trying to be. There's never a point where I'm like, okay, yeah, I get it. Like, this doesn't really need to be in here, but I, it'll make sense later kind of a thing. Like, it all fits. It's all perfect for the journey he's going through in this movie. And then also, by the way, now he's killed Harry's dad. And Harry's not going to like that. when He's going to figure something out at some point. And oh, by the way, now that he's made this decision to finally accept all these things, he's going to lose his powers. You know what I mean? Like... It's like it still sets all that stuff up, but it never it never feels like it's at the expense of the movie I'm watching, which is like rare, I think. So I, I think that's a big plus. Absolutely. Sam Sam Raimi was the perfect person to take the reins here and completely knew how to execute the story and just use so all those good building blocks to not only like hint at what's to come, but make sure that the things that he's hinting at still relate to the movie at hand and that it doesn't detract from the movie you're watching. It only complements it. Yeah. And that's a, that's a tough balancing act to do. So all the credit goes to Sam Raimi for pulling off 
such uh, an incredible feat with this movie. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, and so many great scenes in this movie. I think, obviously, you know, we we briefly touched on it before, but that scene in the rain, and it's such a a good, I think, approximation of like where the two of them are in that moment, where like they're doing this kind of dancing act around each other, and they're yeah. getting and they're getting to get that moment together without actually like getting it knowing that they need it in the way they want because obviously like peter's been waiting for this his entire fucking life and i think subtly in those moments too like even if she's not very cognizant of it i think she is receptive to it as well so it's well, almost like yeah, he's she doesn't know it's peter like you're getting that like exactly that's what i'm saying interesting yeah. part of the middle of this movie that like mary jane is in a love quadrangle really with like, <laughs> with, like harry peter kind of like she you can tell she's starting to see that like peter actually cares about like what's going on in her life and like who she is as a person like way more than harry does and then also like the the fourth part here is spider-man and she doesn't realize that two of those are the same person yeah and like so like this is like i don't know like it's like it's like her recognizing that she's unhappy in her current relationship and like like not necessarily making a choice but like that's why spider-man's in the thing dude because he's flashy he's cool he'll kiss you hanging upside down in the rain yeah. that's like his go-to you know yeah. so like i don't know i just think that's like an interesting part of this movie and it also makes that ending better where like she still doesn't know he's spider-man so she's choosing peter parker over a super over spider -Man. yeah like... over spider-man well yeah, yeah because which peter, is peter... wild she realizes in that moment that that Peter's the one that's always always been there. Like you see her at the yeah. beginning, like when she's trying to like get away from her like abusive dad, and like Peter's just out in the backyard and starts talking to her about the school play. Yeah, yeah. I totally. cried like a baby in the school play. She's like, we were. <laughs> she's like, we were like seven. <laughs> like he's such a dweeb. It's so little great. creepy, little creepy. Yeah, a little creepy. Yeah, everything. But but everything he says is on the right side of creepy. Um, where it's like it's almost like endearing. And not more. Yeah, I mean, when it's in a movie, yeah, because they can like make him look endearing. I'm trying to see if there's like a way you could say those things in real life without people. Being oh like, yeah, what? no, no. Well, I no, remember it, that. Like that's yeah. so weird. <laughs> yeah, in, re in real life, it definitely would be off-putting, uh, unless you're good looking. If you're good looking, you can get away with anything. They'll they'll be like, oh, he's he's, he's hilarious. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, but but you know, and obviously we we've been hinting at it. But I think the movie that we didn't mention in the box office that we're coming up to is going to be a good example of saying things like that that come off as creepy oh, and not yeah. that yeah. are on the wrong side of pining off of a girl. Uh, so we're <laughs> definitely going to be seeing seeing a tale of two halves on how to effectively write, you know, somebody pining over a loved one in a movie and how to not effectively write <laughs> pining over somebody in a movie. Yeah. Yeah, when we come up fair. to our next episode. Um, now, is there anything about this movie that doesn't jive for you that you don't like? I mean, like, we, we we talked about it a little bit earlier, like, the idea that, like, everybody's, like, clearly, like, almost 30. <laughs> like, they're all, like, so old. Like, like Willem Dafoe and, and Harry look more like brothers than they do, <laughs> like, father and son, you know what I mean? Um but like like th so that's a little bit weird but that's also just kind of like of its time kind of a thing and the the only other thing is like this is probably one of those movies where the whole time i'm watching it i'm kind of like oh yeah but like i really like i kind of just wish i was watching spider-man too because like as good as this is and as much as it stands on its own i still feel like spider-man 2 is like the superior movie you know what i mean so um it's not quite the best version of this which like throws me off a little bit um but not really i mean like You're... everything else it feels like it's doing exactly what it's trying to do you know like it, it doesn't feel like anything's like too out of place for me i guess in that sense though i got you you want to try and look at a, the like even though we have all this context of later movies and everything try and forget those exist while you're looking at it because i get also being like you know, being like, oh, yes, but Spider-Man 2 is the best version of this. But I don't think that detracts from how good this movie is. Like, I I, I don't like when I'm when I'm sitting in there trying, you know, as we're going to get up to it and think about my review and rating for this one. I don't want the fact that I like the other one more to detract from what is this great superhero movie, because I think for because, you know, to those two points, like I, I get those and those are valid, but they seem, you know, very nitpicky. 
yeah i mean they definitely are and i mean like i get why you maybe wouldn't want that to be part of your rating but for me it definitely is like because yeah part of the point of this is like we're going back and re-watching things and like that's just always a pet peeve for me like if it's not the best version of a specific movie i'm always kind of like oh man like it's not but it could be this one instead like and i could just watch that and this is the best version yeah so it, i feel it, it. no i feel that and that's me, that's it definitely is part of like how i rate these things yeah no, like, but that's the bad. Thing is, if i'm looking at spider-man 2 and spider-man 1 and i can only pick one of them to watch like today i'm yeah. gonna pick spider-man 2 every time and um that has to mean something about this movie, doesn't it? Like, <laughs> like. Yeah, that's fair. I can give you that. That's a that's a valid point. I mean, in that scenario, it's to each his own. It's it's, you know, your ability to, you know, want to always watch the or look for the best version of a type of property, or being able to, you know, put that one out of your mind when you're watching something else. Yeah. Um, to try, it's it's definitely a balancing act. But I get what you're saying in the point, especially in the point of us, you know, going back and seeing you know watching these movies and seeing how they hold up in comparison to uh, you know everything that's come since then um yeah, it's definitely like, it's definitely a valid um thought to have in like the back of your mind as you're going through all this i'm also willing to admit that i do get a little crazy with it but i've just like kind of embraced <laughs> it because if i watch something that i think is the best version of a specific movie i just won't see any of the sequels calls after that like like That's i still to this day haven't seen dark knight rises because i was like what's the point like it's never going to be better than that movie like what's like they already did the best version of this i don't need to see dark knight rises like very bold very bold yeah, yeah which that I, is I that is definitely on one side like of the that. spectrum <laughs> not everybody's like that i would say most people aren't like that but i'm definitely yeah. like that like if i see something and i'm like yep it's never going to be better than this i'm just done watching that thing <laughs> like fair i mean until something comes out that is i mean you just think nothing can be better than that thing but you don't know i mean yeah maybe I, maybe the spider-man honestly might be the movie that did it for me too because like seeing spider-man 3 i like spider-man 3 but would i really have been worse off if i had just stopped at spider-man 2 and not <laughs> seen any of the andrew garfield ones or any of the i mean ones? Yeah, like, but then, not. <laughs> if you stopped at Spider Man, okay. if you stopped at Spider Man Two, then you would have missed out on emo Peter Parker, which is you know an <laughs> absolute yeah. classic of of That's number fair, three. Yeah. Um, and I mean for because I'm I'm right there with you that like the only thing that I could really say in the negative here is really just a nitpick at best because it doesn't affect my ability to enjoy this movie. And that is is that there's there's one or two moments where you really feel the mid 2000 cgi in this there there are one yeah. or two spots that really really don't hold up and, and look a little and look very uncanny valley that's uh, fair. Yeah. but but again like that's a nitpick like it, it doesn't detract from my ability to enjoy this movie and i think that's that's all i got to say about that jimbo do you have anything else to add about the classic that is spider-man but not spider-man 2 for you nah i'd say that's it I am very interested to see where you're dropping some IMDb deep dive. So I've got two. Ooh, um, a twofer. I don't know if we're going to do both of them, but I've narrowed it down to two. And then gotcha. I will say and I'm, I'm saving I'm... Tobey Maguire for the sequel. Gotcha. And I'm guessing that one of them is Kirsten Dunst because we're we're very actress deficient when it comes to IMDb sometimes. Uh you may have just called out my bias because neither of them are Kirsten Dunst. Oh ooh. I have a feeling Kirsten Dunst will make more appearances though. I that is sure she will. She is the, I the... think more than these other two people anyway. Because she's okay. in a lot of movies like in the early two thousands. And okay. not that these guys aren't, but I'm not sure that a lot of them are ones you would have seen, if that makes sense. Gotcha. All right. All right. Hit like, me with They're them. not a big uh, a Wes Anderson fan, for example. So, like, we're not going to catch Willem Dafoe on uh, Steve Zizou. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did see Steve Zizou, though. Did you see Steve Zizou? Wow. That was, okay. that was the only, I think that's the only Wes Anderson movie I've ever seen in theaters. That was the Wes Anderson movie where you were like, yep, not seeing those anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, um, 
so all right so let's start though i want to do sam raimi to start because Ooh, all right talked yeah. a lot about how this is kind of like this whole spider-man original trilogy is really his like baby right um and sam raimi feels like a guy we can play a little this or that with right instead of just like going through their credits and well also he has like a lot of different movies that somebody could arguably pitch as like their favorite yeah, so we're gonna go with Sam Raimi. We're gonna like focus on director credits here. Gotcha. Um, do you take Spider Man or The Evil Dead? <laughs> Spider Man, but I do really, really enjoy The Evil Dead. Yeah, I'm gonna take Spider Man too. Is that the same for Spy uh, for Evil Dead Two and Army of Darkness? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's about right. Although I, I think it's I Spider-Man. think it's fair to say I'm probably gonna take Spider Man over most of sam raimi's movie <laughs> we shall see there's a couple of there's a couple of interesting ones here um do you remember the 1990 movie starring liam uh is it liam neeson no not liam neeson what's that guy's name why am liam... i like do you remember do you remember dark man that's liam neeson it is liam neeson right yeah yeah for, for some reason i was getting him confused with leslie nielsen <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, know, Leslie, yeah. Leslie Nielsen I'm, I'm is. Not, I've been on man. cough medicine, prescribed <laughs> cough medicine for like three days. I'm having a rough go of it. So, yes, yes. Spider Man or 1990s also superhero movie Dark Man. Spider Man, but it, it is clear at watching Dark Man why he was like the perfect person to uh, to jump us forward in in the superhero genre with Spider Man. Absolutely. So I think we're gonna get to our first real interesting one here okay um are you gonna you're gonna take... say something silly i know it i know it <laughs> no, no 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 no. this is like legit this is i swear this isn't silly um spider-man or the quick and the dead Ooh. yeah I, I, uh, I told you some of these would be interesting <laughs> yeah that one is i thought you were gonna go silly and i thought you were gonna say for love of the game but then you went you went serious oh uh, i mean that's coming up, and I'll give you a little spoiler. I am not picking Spider Man, but keep going. <laughs> um, no, I'm I'm still gonna take Spider Man, but that's a very close one. I will take the Quick and the Dead. That's I I wouldn't hate you for it. That's fair. That's a great fucking movie. It's a great movie. Um, all right. So moving on. Um, have you seen the Gift? I don't know what the Gift is uh no i've heard of it though i think it's a thriller movie there's like a bunch of people in it i think like keanu reeves is in it the gift hold on i'm gonna at least read the... i'm pretty sure kate blanchett's in it i think kate blanchett's the main girl oh yeah kate blanchett and katie holmes yeah katie holmes yeah there's like a wide by billy bob thornton what <laughs> oh boy dude dark i gotta watch that movie is it by like that billy bob thornton it's gotta be right i, I can't imagine there's two of them out there Wow, Hillary Swank's in this? How did I how have I never seen this? A fortune teller with the extrasensory perception. Oh wait, with extrasensory perception is asked to help find a young woman who has mysteriously disappeared. Well, that's getting added to my list for sure. I could watch that. Uh, but for right now, it seems like neither one of us can pick between that or Spider-Man. Um then his next three credits are Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2, and Spider-Man 3. So we're not gonna pick between those right now i don't think right even though i think from us talking everyone can kind of figure out what yeah, I spider-man I was clear. i think it's pretty clear what order we have them in yeah um yeah three two one exactly right it's a countdown <laughs> um so then next would be do you take spider-man or 2009's drag me to hell oh wait no i skipped over what i was, I was gonna, gonna say about. yeah where's for love of the you game take spider-man or for the love of the game when did that come out 1999 it was all right so so it was before it was before the spider-mans yeah it was before spider-mans um no i would still take spider-man but i do love it for the love of the game i do love the love of the game i haven't seen for the love of the game probably since like the early 2000s and i remember thinking it was like the greatest sports movie i'd ever seen at the time like that's a really good movie it's like all like it like goes in and out of flashbacks like while he's pitching like a no hitter right for like his last game I wanted to say it's a perfect game and like it go like it's him like 
on the mound and he can like block out the crowd yeah and he's like thinking about all the like twists and turns and his like throughout his life, life. That have, yeah like, brought yeah him to this point and oh dude i gotta watch that, that again sacrificed for the love of the game yeah <laughs> and, like, i gotta watch that again like, man that's been a minute he's going through all of it while he's doing the hardest thing to do in baseball doing the, yeah pitcher. it's yeah. so good man. It's... Yeah, you gotta watch that again. Um, it's been a minute. No, I remember that movie being really good. Yeah, and like there's one point where like he's like a pitcher and he gets like his pitching hand like cut by a buzzsaw. It's like, dude, what is going yeah. on in this movie? Like he's come back from so much for the love of the game. I <laughs> love that movie. I, I gotta watch that again, dude, because I haven't seen it in a long time and I remember it being one of my favorites. Yeah, no, I was really good at that movie. Um, all right, so then that brings us back to would you take Spider Man or 2009's Drag Me to Hell? Uh, I've actually never seen that movie, so. Me neither. Um, he doesn't really have a lot of directing credits left, so I have. Until he makes his comeback uh, in the MCU. Yeah, well, that's going to be probably the next one, because there's like, there's, oh, okay, this is actually a pretty big one. Uh, oh, I know what you're going to say. Take Spider-Man or 2013's Oz the Oz Great the and Powerful? powerful. <laughs> Not that movie. I'll take Spider Man. I've never seen. I was like, I'll take Spider Man. Oh, uh, it's. I mean, it's not the worst movie because uh, Sam Raimi is is a great director, but it's not a fantastic movie. It's yeah, kind of yeah. just there. That's fair. Um, and then so he does like he directs one episode of Ash versus the Evil Dead. That's like that Evil Dead TV show that they redid, like that that came yeah. out in the mid 2010s. And then, as you alluded to, he directs 2022s. Do you take? spider-man or dr strange in the multiverse of madness Gee, let me think about that one <laughs> spider-man i'm taking spider-man but i'm also going to take a stand here and say that in the multiverse of madness is far too maligned it is a really good movie <laughs> and it's uh it's written by one of the guys who, he worked on like um rick and morty for a while and then i think he's like the showrunner for loki gotcha um what the heck's his name let me look I know who you're talking about i can't think of his name michael but i know who waldron you're i want to say let me see though i mean yeah, i don't michael waldron he's like okay. a legit writer he's like a legit i think he's a really good yeah. writer last last sam raimi film i want to touch on he did not okay. direct this and i don't think he wrote it he's probably just kind of like a the producer or something yeah producer but i don't even know how important of a producer like it just feels like the kind of movie where they want to put sam raimi's name on the poster okay. how awesome was crawl <laughs> Oh, yeah, that was a great movie. Oh, yeah, they did put his name on the poster for that. He had to have just been like an executive producer for like right, right. They're just like, hey, Sam, like we want to put your name on the poster. Do you want like a credit in this movie? Like, <laughs> yeah, that was a great. That was a really good creature feature. Yeah, I love Crawl. Who played the dad in Crawl again? I forget. Barry Pepper, name. baby. Yes, Barry Pepper. That's Barry so motherfucking Pepper. Yeah, that movie is really good. I gotta watch that again soon. Yeah, a lot of we, we we've learned there's a lot of good classics to revisit um in this episode. So we got we got plenty to add to the list to watch uh here in the future. So thank you for that, Sam Raimi. You are a legend as always. But now it is time to dive into our star ratings. Hi, I'm Roger Ebert. It's been a scene from the best film of the decade. This is a great film. God damn right, Raj. All right, Jim, let's hear it. Although I can, I think I already have a sense of where you're going with this one, but let's hear it. Final star ratings and thoughts. The yeah. Spider Man. Godspeed, Spider Man. I'm not gonna have a lot more thoughts. Just that this is like a really good kickoff to what I think is a really good trilogy, and it kind of sets the stage for what movies really become by the time that you catch up to us in like I don't maybe not as much in 2024, but like in 2020 and like 2019 and 2018, like every movie owes a lot to this movie um but without much ado i'm just gonna give it uh four out of five four out of five i knew that was i knew that was where you were going <laughs> yeah i could i could sense it i could feel it in my bones uh that is that's that's good i i am going the full monty jim i'm i'm, I'm taking the lead here again oh. No uh yeah i'm i'm gonna give this movie five stars to to me this movie is iconic it's especially for superhero movies because as we know i'm not the biggest fan of superhero movies so when yeah. when you could find a way to not only hit on the zeitgeist but also meld that blockbuster status with the great you know subtext and subtlety of 
good pathos like we like, uh, I will fall in love with your movie. And this movie balances all of that so well. Uh, you know, not we've said so much we can about like just the perfect casting and how well this movie still holds up today really plays a factor in it. And some of that might be nostalgia and some of it is due to the fact that it's just a really great movie. But yeah. this is a movie that sits in my rotation consistently because it's just, you know, one of the seminal pieces of film from my childhood. So I absolutely adore this movie. So I'm going the full Monty and I'm giving it the five. So with a five from me and a four from Jimbo is good enough to put Spider-Man it with a nine. And that's going to put it. We got, let's look on this list right here. Good enough to tie it with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, which also has a nine. So Jim, as we love oh, yeah, to we do on here. Right? You gave that one a four and I gave it a five. Yeah, yeah, we flipped there. Yeah, I gave a four. You gave a five to Harry Potter. Um, so now we're going to have to duke it out. What do you take? <laughs> but I mean, although I'm I think we're obviously going to take the one I gave yeah, a five. <laughs> you're obviously going to take the one I, you gave a five to and I'm obviously going to take the one that I gave a five to, even though I gave Spider-Man a five and I still stand by that five. I'm not like gutted. If Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone takes the edge here. And Spider-Man sits behind it. Like, I'm not going to lose sleep over that. Like, yeah, it, you, I mean, you're, you're in such a, like, weeds there where it's, like, it's so such a thin margin to, like, justify. I'm not going to lose sleep if Spider-Man sits behind Harry Potter, you know? They're just, they're both really great movies. So, like, if anybody's, like, I like Spider-Man more than Harry Potter, I'm going to be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, that's cool. Yeah, exactly. It's a really good movie. Yeah. Like, why not? <laughs> like, I'm, I'm the same way. So, I think maybe in the scenarios like that, you know, like, you know where we're also trying to figure out how to battle titanic and lord of the rings maybe we just leave it in a sense where if we can't you know like justify it because it's like yeah whoever takes either one i'm not gonna lose sleep over it how maybe just spider-man slots in underneath it because we did it after harry potter yeah and then like let's see if people want to like comment on which one they like better you know like make your arguments for why we should put one higher than the other because i can't pick really it's true yeah i can't think i can't think either so if somebody down in the comments has a good justification for why either movie should sit above the other we'll take it into consideration maybe if maybe whichever movie gets the most traction in the comments is the one that we'll take as the gospel but i'm i'm okay here i'm not gonna lose sleep with Harry Potter sitting above Spider-Man and Spider-Man slotting in just behind it. I'm I oh, can yeah. completely I can completely live with that just because it's like we did Harry Potter first. So that's where that one slides. Spider-Man comes in right underneath it because we did it afterwards. But if somebody came up to me and was like Harry Potter's better, I'd be like, fair. If somebody came up to me and said Spider-Man's better, I'd be like, fair. I can't Harry argue Potter's with that. Better, by the way. <laughs> I mean, I fair. I can't <laughs> hey, I can't argue with that. No, but like <laughs> it's not even like like I I gave one of five and one of four, and like I guess. The way I would put it is, like, I'm not even necessarily saying one's, like, better than the other, like, objectively, because that's not even really a thing. It's just, like, the Harry Potter, to me, is, like, more perfect for what it's trying to be, right? And we, we talked about that a bunch in the episode we did. Like, it's a movie that, like, is ambitious and, like, whimsical, and it absolutely nails that for like 150 minutes straight so like that's like i just think like not and like spider-man also was really really good for what it was trying to be and like did everything it was trying to do it's just like for me personally not quite as well you know fair i can again i can't i can't argue with that <laughs> like it, it it's when you get into the thick weeds like this it's tough because you're really just justifying your like your personal feelings to the subject matter and at that exactly. point it's like how how can we really like pull like I, i'm not gonna fight you on how that movie speaks to you and be yeah, like no I, like spider-man's better like because of I this because up, at that point it's just my opinion being truth a long time ago <laughs> exactly exactly like we have no like to us these movies are just our feelings they are not the gospel um, so I'm, I'm with you on that one. All right. So, so I'm totally fine with Spider-Man. We did it afterwards. So Spider-Man settles in just underneath Sorcerer's Stone. So it takes the number five position. And just as I planned, the movie I gave a five wins. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, Jim's like, I've been subtly dropping breadcrumbs of manipulation <laughs> for the last seven weeks to build to this. 
Mind manipulation. <laughs> master manipulator, master manipulator. He's like, dance for me, puppet. <laughs> right. So, but that's still, that's a really good top five right there. I, I will not lose any sleep over that being the case. So Spider-Man sits now in the number five position with a, with a nine. And I can I can sleep soundly tonight knowing that that is just the case. Uh, Jim, we're not going to go and take guesses as to the movie for what is next week because clearly you've hyped up your thought there. You know yeah, what I it mean, is, so you might as well drum roll it and tell the people what next week's episode is. It's another doozy. I am fairly sure that you saw this in theaters and it was like the only movie that I think you would have seen uh, <laughs> that we went, that came up in the box office. It is episode two attack of the clones that is right this is another one that you you've been waiting for you know you think oh, all yeah. the way back to we did phantom menace however many episodes back and you've been waiting in the wings as well for attack of the clones uh and we are once again back into the world of star wars yeah i'm excited this is one of my personal favorite star wars movies yeah this is going to be a fun one to dive into too i actually i got a jump on this one um, because not too long ago, they re-released uh, The Phantom Menace back in theaters, and I made Heather go see it. And yeah. she enjoyed it to the point that and she needed to watch the other ones. So I just recently never watched. Seen the Star Wars prequels? No, she had never watched the prequels, because I tried showing her the original trilogy first, because I was like, you have to do it the way everybody did it. Like, you get four, five, and six, and then one, two, and three. Like, it's the way you got to party. And Heather's very particular about old movies, can't she can't fuck with old special effects so made it through That's four bad. made it through four and five agreed that five was a good movie but didn't want to watch any more of the originals because she was like i don't like how it looks so she was less she was less interested in them because of how it looked so i was like yeah, all right i mean you already saw the best one anyway so i'm not gonna like the most spectacular practical effects movies ever made but sure okay. yeah yeah exactly yeah exactly yeah sure but you know you die on that hill heather that's all you yeah. uh, so i know uh, you already saw empire so i wasn't gonna like force feed return of the jedi down her throat um but i, I always yeah, kept it in the mean, back of my fair. mind if she was tapping out after empire return of the jedi is like not wasn't gonna do anything for her yeah like the quest to sell ewok toys <laughs> like yeah. she didn't need to watch that one <laughs> yeah exactly but i kept in the back of my head where i was like i think she'll like one two and three because like the special effects while still kind of you know dated into where we are today are still at least more aligned with stuff that she can stomach so i kept it in the back pocket and i was like i'm not going to give it to her anytime soon like i'll wait i'll wait on that one and then when they re-released it in theaters i was like now is the time you're going to watch this yeah. and and it worked because then right after that she wanted the next day we watched two and the day after that we watched three so she was heavily on board with the prequels so nice. i am i am up to date on my attack of the clone so i'm i'm ready to really? dive into that to that good I, stuff. I watched it when we did the phantom menace episode i watched attack of the clones like right after because i just couldn't help myself <laughs> and, uh, i just i it's bad but i still love that movie <laughs> well well yeah well we'll, we'll dive into uh, the absolute mixed feelings that i think every star wars fan grapples with when it comes to attack of the clones oh no but... don't get me wrong my feelings are not mixed whatsoever <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we'll talk more about that next week. Yeah, well, that that that's a whole other can of worms as we dive into. It. That's also going to be a big, huge, glorious episode. And we we wondered with Spider Man only being the third highest grossing movie of the year, will Attack of the Clones take one of those two spots that was above Spider Man? That's going to be an interesting thing to see come next yeah. week. Yeah. So that's going to be fun. Do you have do you think um? It will be? Like, not do having... I think it will be? Without knowing right now, because we have without it. knowing right now, I would I would guess that it would take the number. Oh, actually, no, nope. I'm gonna say it doesn't. Interesting. I'm gonna say it does, and I'm. I guess we'll find out next week. We'll why find out next week. Let's, yeah, let's try not to spoil ourselves, but yeah, yeah let's. We'll, we'll find out next week. But I I'm going to guess that it doesn't, because I think I know the two that are above it. Um, but we'll we'll wait we'll wait okay. until we until we do Star Wars. Um, do you have anything to leave the people with uh, on our way out here, Jim? You you got any new recommendations? No, I mean like we just we talked about it on a on a episode not too long ago. So I've went back and I've been watching uh, the Next Generation, the show. <laughs> uh, so I see so you're still in on the Next Generation. Yeah, I'm like, well, no, like we didn't talk about watching it. Like it came up for some reason. Oh, it was in the Jimmy Neutron one because Patrick Stewart was one of the voices. That's right. That's right. 
So since we talked about it and Patrick Stewart came up, I was like, you know what I need in my life? A little Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the USS Enterprise. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I do have a new show. I, wa- I watch oh, something new, Jim. You'll be very shocked show? at this. You never watch new shows. Well, what are you watching? So I, o- I watched it because it was a miniseries and there won't be another season. So I was is, able. Is it the apples never fall? <laughs> No, no, it wasn't. But I, I, I promise you, I am going to get to that one. Okay. No, it was um the because you know how much I love me some Hi- Hiroyuki Sonata, and I'm sorry if I keep pronouncing your name wrong. I'd love you. Oh, so I watched okay. Shogun, interesting, uh, the Hulu okay. show. Um, fantastic. Can't yeah, recommend. That's, it. that's what I've heard. I've heard it's really good. I haven't gotten around to it yeah, yet. Really, really good. I, I waited until all the episodes dropped because I'm not. I wasn't waiting week to week. Um, and then I binged it. And it was fantastic. So that that's go did watch you ever, that. Did you ever see the original Shogun miniseries? No, but I, I heard I it's something it's from like the eighties. <laughs> yeah, I think it was like the eighties or early nineties. Yeah, and I, I watched I heard... it when I was a kid with my dad. I barely remember it, but I just remember that there was one. Imagine that one. Probably they did placed a better emphasis on making the the white guy the main character probably more than doing the due diligence of really diving into the world of Japanese culture. I'd say that was probably fair. What <laughs> like what year does it take place in the show, by the way? In the 1600s. I think it's like the early oh, 1600s, yeah. they say. So it's like, okay, cool. That's interesting. Yeah, it was really, it was really, it's really Like good. right around like when Japan's like reunifying, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. So it's right around that. And then it's around the time too when um the um the Portuguese are like really trying to bring Christianity over. And like right. taking the stranglehold on Christianity, um, so it's it's it was it was really freaking good. I lo- I loved it. Nice, yeah. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. So you go. You heard it out there, people. Check out some Shogun. Watch some Star Trek: Next Generation. It's all good. It's all classics. If you haven't watched TNG by now. I just don't know what you're doing, man. I haven't watched TNG. You need to watch TNG. <laughs> maybe I did watch the movies, so maybe it's finally time to dive into. I the... just got up to the second season when they grew the beard. That's like so you know the you know the phrase jumping the shark? Yeah. There's like the reverse of that is called growing the beard because the first season of the next generation is kind of like eh. Yeah. And then in the second season, the the Jonathan Frakes or whatever his name is, the guy who plays like Commander Riker, grows yeah. the beard and the show just takes off. <laughs> like... That's hilarious. I love how people just take it from movies and television shows to like equate that because like you had yeah. the same thing with indiana jones and they were they were like nuking the fridge yeah 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 it's like that's so funny i love when they do stuff like that uh but all right yeah so drop drop your comments down below on spider-man let's hear your thoughts uh make your justification for if it should sit above harry potter or not um and make sure you tune back in next week when we dive into the another 2002 classic Star Wars episode 2 Attack of the Clones and until next time as always we'll see you at the movies <laughs>